Breaking right now on Morning News Now, panic and fear in Gaza ahead of a highly anticipated ground attack. This morning, Israel ordering Gazans to evacuate as its military presence grows at the border. Meanwhile, more rocket fire raining down on the Hamas-run region. The death toll getting higher as of this morning. More than 2,800 have been killed in the fighting, at least 27 of them American and several others still missing. And now a strong show of support from the U.S. with the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, now both in the Middle East. It's hard to find the right words. It's beyond what anyone would ever want to imagine, much less actually see and God forbid experience. This as families of those still missing plead for help finding their loved ones. Back here in the U.S., authorities bracing for protests as a former Hamas leader calls for a worldwide day of rage. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Let's begin with NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea, who joins us from Jerusalem as part of our team coverage this morning. So, Kelly, the Israeli military has warned more than one million people in the northern part of Gaza to move south within 24 hours. What more are they saying about this order? Is this part of the preparation for this expected ground offensive? <laughs> Well, it very well could be, but they're not saying much. They're definitely not backing off of this order, though, uh, Joe and Savannah, that they are um, sticking by it, even as the U.N. says that it could come with devastating humanitarian consequences. Uh, there are people who are packing up in Gaza. They're trying to get out. They're trying to move south. Uh, the problem, well, there are many of them. There aren't enough cars, first of all, to get people to the south. There isn't enough fuel uh, for people to fill their tanks and get south. And once they get there, there's nowhere for them to stay. Compounding that problem, Gaza City in the north is where the Strip's largest hospital is located, Shifa Hospital. People have been taking shelter there. There are scores, hundreds of people being treated there, uh, evacuated a hospital in less than 24 hours is just not even conceivable. And that is why you're hearing the United Nations saying, look, this is going to end in tragedy for lots of people. Compounding the problem, you have infrastructure issues. There is a way to get south, but there are also roads that are blocked for some families uh, after just days, six days of intensive bombing. 750 more targets hit by the IDF overnight, according to defense forces. Guys. Kelly, what's the reaction been like to to this order from inside Gaza, people who live there who don't know where to go. You mentioned also how the UN has reacted, but expand on that. Tell us what human rights groups are saying. Yeah, I mean, it's it's virtually impossible for a lot of these people to leave. They, you know, don't have, the, there's been a blockade on the Gaza Strip for the past six days. That means no water, no food, no fuel for generators, no medicine, nothing is getting in. The Gaza Strip is 25 miles long and a couple miles across. So the distances between the north and south are not massive, but the problem is just simply getting there. People are afraid. Uh, there are hundreds of children who have been killed already. There are hundreds of thousands of people, according to the United Nations, who are homeless because of the bombing, uh, close to 400,000 people. Uh, so it's it's simply a matter of getting from A to B. It's, it's not possible for a lot of people to make that journey. And people are very, very frightened. There are no bomb shelters. There are no sirens there. There's nowhere to hide from the bombs, and they simply don't know what to do at this point. Kelly, this morning we also heard from Hamas alleging that some of the hostages who were taken from Israel back into Gaza, that they've been killed by the Israeli bombing of Gaza. What is Hamas saying about that, and what are Israeli officials saying about it? 
Yeah, Hamas claims that 13 hostages were killed in the airstrikes. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an exact timing uh, connected to that, but they have made similar claims in the past. Uh, the Israeli officials, from what we've seen, have not yet uh, responded to that. Please correct me if you've seen something that I haven't. Uh, but in the past, just a couple of days ago, when similar claims arose, the Israeli government warned against taking Hamas at its word. So I suspect we would hear something similar now. And quite frankly, we haven't seen any uh, evidence. We can't verify the claim. So we just don't know whether uh, ho any hostages have been killed in the airstrikes. Joe, Savannah. And Kelly, we know that Secretary Blinken met with the Palestinian president in Jordan earlier today. This is after visiting Israel yesterday. What came out of those talks? Yeah, so we're still waiting for a readout from the U.S. side, but Secretary of State Antony Blinken did meet with Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president. He is deeply unpopular among Palestinians, so he's walking a very fine line uh, after these uh, uh, terrorist attacks by Hamas on Saturday. Uh, in fact, he has not directly condemned the attacks. He has condemned attacks on civilians in general on both sides. So it'll be interesting to hear uh, what that conversation was like, what the readout is, and whether a boss is able to come out and uh, strongly say that he condemns uh, what happened to so many Israelis in the South on mm -hmm. Saturday. Guys. All right. Kelly Kobaya, thank you for starting us out this hour. Let's continue our coverage with NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel, who has more on the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Gaza right now, and a warning some scenes might be distressing for viewers. Come in. There's an air war in Gaza, with Hamas firing barrages of rockets toward Israel, to little effect. Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system launching tiny projectiles at supersonic speed, intercepting and destroying nearly all of them. Israel's airstrikes are not being stopped. They're slamming into Gaza, where there are no air defenses. The United Nations is sounding the alarm of a growing humanitarian crisis. Human rights groups are calling for civilians to be allowed to leave and for aid to enter the 139 square mile territory that's home to 2 million Palestinians, 40% of them under 15. Israel says it will keep attacking Gaza until Hamas is destroyed. The Israeli military says it only targets Hamas. But what about the children? Medical officials say more than 1,500 Palestinians have been killed and 6,000 wounded. And those numbers could grow quickly. Israel's military is amassing tanks and troops along the border with Gaza. Its chief of staff saying now it is time for war and that the head of Hamas and all those who operate under him deserve to die. 22-year-old Palestia Alakad lives in Gaza. The media is barely covering, covering any news because of the situation. There is no electricity, there is no connection. Like, Israelis are literally bombing everywhere, nowhere is safe. These words, life in Gaza, right now, they don't make any sense to any Gazan li living in here because we don't know what does the word life mean. We're expecting death at any minute. We're expecting that the whole, like, Gaza Strip will be erased at any minute. The Gaza Strip is bordered by Israel, the Mediterranean Sea, and Egypt. All exits are closed and blocked. Refugees are not streaming out. This isn't Ukraine. No one is taking in the people of Gaza. We couldn't handle this amount of injuries, and um, it's just heartbreaking. Dr. Sarah al Saka is a Palestinian surgeon based in Gaza. She says she's working 24-hour shifts, and when she can, is posting to social media to show conditions there. No one can leave Gaza. No one can enter Gaza. There is no crossing borders, nothing left for anyone to do. It's a, a huge, big cage that we, are, that we are trapped inside. And someone from outside is just keep on bombing, nonstop bombing, and there is nowhere else to go. Israel says it had no choice but to attack, to disarm and deter Hamas after more than 1,500 gunmen stormed into Israel, butchered entire families, desecrated their bodies, killed at least 1,300 Jews, and took hostages, including children and the elderly. 
Israel's reprisal is underway. It is massive, intensifying, and could trigger a regional war. And our thanks to Richard Engel for that report. Yeah, we just heard from Richard. There is nowhere to go in Gaza. People uh, are essentially trapped, and that includes American Hashan Kayout, the husband and father from Texas, left two weeks ago to vacation in Gaza with his brother and nephew. And now as Israel prepares to launch its ground offensive, they have no way of getting out. So his wife, Haifa Kayout, joins us now from their home near Dallas. Haifa, thank you so much for joining us during this tough time. Israel's military, as we've been reporting this morning, now ordering civilians to evacuate to the southern part of Gaza. I know you've been able to have some communication with your husband. What is he telling you? The situation is very bad and bombing uh, every day, 24 hours. Uh, last night, I was texting him. Only we contact through text because there is no any electricity or calls. So he was absent for two hours, and then he came back. He said, 40 bombs in this couple of hours only, and we need to get out. He is there with his brothers. He has his elder brother. He's sick with heart disease, and they're supposed to be out by now. And it's bad. Now he just texted me. They're getting ready to move from north to south. So how they will go, how they will move, I don't know. So how your husband, he's been in the north at this point. Do you know where he will stay when he gets to the south? They have a, a cousin there, and I don't know. They will go to his cousin house. There are almost 40 people now in the house with his brothers, uh, uh, nephews, nieces. How they will manage this, I don't know. Wow. I know you've been calling immigration services, U.S. embassies, elected officials, in hopes of trying to get help to get your family out of Gaza. What have they been saying? Have you heard anything concrete or been able to make any progress? No, nothing. I was calling, leaving messages, but nothing came out. We are stressed. We don't know if he will come back safely or not. Hopefully, he will be back safely. But we are under big stress. What is going through your mind right now, Haifa? Now, after the news of taking uh, the North people out, m was my hope more now. My hope is going less that we, he can make it and get out. Oh. And you... only I'm praying to bring my husband back to me and all with his brothers. They went five from here, four from California, my husband from Texas, they joined together and they went for vacation two weeks and come back. And now they are stuck. You mentioned that your brother-in-law uh, has heart disease. We know that the situation in Gaza is getting tough from a medical perspective as well, supplies running low, uh, hospitals having been damaged and very limited. Do you know how he's doing? Uh, two days ago, my husband, I asked him, how's your brother? He said he's having like kind of flu symptoms with diarrhea and he's not feeling well, but he can't reach to any clinic or any hospital with all this happening. So only praying for him. Last night, my husband said, I said, how do you feel? How are you? He said, I feel like I got a flu. My body is hurting me, headache, and my eyes burning. Then I was telling him, just try to drink more water, hot things. So he's telling, the little water we have, it's not clean. Mm. So, okay, I don't know what to say, but hang on, what to do? Take Tylenol every four hours. Hi, for Nothing. what? What are you hoping for right now? How do you hope this ends? My husband, okay, I want the war to end, praying for all the people and my husband to come back home.
to his family and his brothers to go back home to their families. Their family is missing him in California. I talk to their wives every day and checking how they are feeling. My sister-in-law, she has her husband and her son. Her son for the first time ever to leave States. He went for vacation. He's 23 years old only. I'm seeing all this happening around him. Haifa Kayoud, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are thinking of your family right now, and please keep us updated on what's happening, all right? Yeah, we'd love to talk to you again. My daughter wanted badly to be with me, but I tried to wake her up. It's 6 a.m. <laughs> now. And we, we, we understand. No, no worries at no all. No worries. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, all right? We wanted to talk about her dad and how much she misses oh. him a lot. Absolutely. Well, we'd love to have you all back, and she can talk about him then. Thank you very much for joining us and getting up so early for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to continue his Middle East trip this weekend, visiting several countries surrounding Israel, including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. It comes after his visit to Tel Aviv yesterday, a move intended to demonstrate the White House's commitment to supporting Israel during this war with Hamas. Blinken sat down with NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt to discuss the future of U.S. involvement in the region and the plan to rescue American hostages. <laughs> Israeli airstrikes relentlessly bombarding Gaza with a potential ground invasion looming. This newly released body camera video from Saturday shows Israeli forces firing at militants and freeing hostages during Hamas's attack. But perhaps the most disturbing images of this war so far were released by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on social media. Photos of babies so horrifying that we will not show you. Hamas has shown itself to be an enemy of civilization. Netanyahu sharing those images with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who traveled to Israel in a show of support from the U.S. It's simply depravity in the worst imaginable way. And Secretary Blinken had this emotional moment with a survivor from the music festival. We're strong here. We're powerful here. I sat down with him soon after. Is there a risk, a greater risk, of a regional war at this point? Uh, we're determined that there not be. Uh, we deployed the largest aircraft carrier group that we have, the Gerald R. Ford, to the region. Uh, we've taken other steps to make it very clear to anyone who might think of taking advantage of this moment that that would be a big mistake. We're working with many other countries in the region, countries that may have influence with those who might consider doing something uh, to use that influence to, to, to uh, prevent it, to avoid it. I also traveled to the Israeli city of Ashkelon, not far from Gaza. Ashkelon is a virtual ghost town, except for a few people we saw at a cafe. Around us, the distant rumble of explosions, airstrikes hitting targets inside Gaza. And here, just a few miles from the Gaza border, evidence of those rocket attacks we've seen so much of. The crater here in the street, and the shrapnel flying in so many directions, destroying this car. The people left here now bracing for the next phase of this war. Many told me they support a ground invasion of Gaza. And must destroy them completely. How will this period be remembered in Israeli history? It'll be remembered as, a, as a, the biggest wake-up call we ever had since the, the Holocaust. This is the time to act, not to talk. I met 26-year-old Daniel Tertarian at a local barber shop, still giving haircuts, a rare relic of peacetime here. In your view, is it going to be necessary to put Israeli troops on the ground? One thing I know for sure that uh, this thing called Hamas, it's, we need to finish them, whatever it takes, whatever it costs. People here are determined to help any way they can. This is kind of a citizen relief organization. They've been delivering food to troops at the front line. I believe they're taking these now to some troops about 15 minutes from here, but very, very close to the Gaza border. Sally Schiff is a dual Israeli-American citizen. If I was young enough and I was able enough, I would be joining that army. And I think everybody here, everybody here would be doing the same thing. We don't fear war. We want peace, but they're not giving us peace. 
Israeli forces say they have already dropped more than 6,000 bombs on Gaza. With power cut off, hospitals are chaotic and overwhelmed. Israel vowing no humanitarian aid will be allowed into Gaza until all hostages are released. Meanwhile, 14 Americans remain unaccounted for, 27 now confirmed dead, including Adrian Netta. I met her son Nahar earlier this week, holding out hope his mom would be found alive. I am confident, mom, I'm confident that you're holding on. We're waiting for you. We love you. Another family torn apart by this war. Thanks to Lester Holt for that report. And for more, we are joined by former Mossad director Ephraim Halevi. Ephraim, thank you very much for joining us this morning on this. So you were the former head of what's known as really one of the best intelligence agencies in the world, and you've seen Israel under attack before. So first, if you wouldn't mind just telling us your analysis of how this compares in terms of the coordination and sophistication of the attack. And I know that you weren't uh, familiar with classified information in this particular instance, but just your thoughts on the fact that this was able to take place undetected. <clears throat> What is clear is that this was a, a uh, an operation which was uh, planned in advance over a long period of time. It was kept secret, and the Hamas uh, leadership was able to prevent uh, any leak concerning it. We were caught surprised uh, a week ago, seven days ago, and uh, we have uh, paid the uh, terrible uh, results, the terrible uh, uh, fee, if you'd like to call it, for the fact that uh, we did not have uh, prior information. I assume that all this aspect of the event will be ultimately researched uh, at the end of the war and not now, because now we are concentrating on how to turn the tide. And I believe that this is now the moment where possibly the tide may turn in the right direction. One of the things that is happening now is trying to figure out the hostages who are currently being held by Hamas and how to get them back. We know Israel has a history of daring raids to try and rescue its citizens, but, but this is a different, unprecedented situation. What are some of the obstacles that the Israeli military and officials are facing? In your opinion, what needs to be done to try and get those hostages back safely? I don't think we will get the hostages back unless uh, the Hamas realizes that if this is not the case, and if the inevitable will happen, and the most uh, horrendous will happen, and we will not see them back alive, I think that in that case, they must uh, assume that the, pay, the price they would pay will, from their point of view, be beyond description. And I'm not saying this in a mood of warning or trying to threaten anybody. I'm simply analyzing the situation the way it is. And if we analyze the situation the way it is, we can, under no circumstances, afford an end to this campaign until the Hamas, who launched it a week ago, and is responsible for all the death that has happened since, all the ter terrible events of uh, decapitation of uh, living people, including babies and other uh, aspects of a horrendous uh, uh, behavior on part of the uh, people who uh, uh, simply flowed into the south of Israel. I think that it must be un understood that Israel cannot and will not uh, let this end in a manner that Hamas will ever be able to uh, restore its uh, capabilities again. So what does that mean you think needs to happen next? Is this that land invasion fr from this analytical perspective that you're discussing? How is that possible? <clears throat> I am not privy to the plans, and I, if I were, I would not reveal them. Uh, the uh, army uh, spokesman uh, issued a warning uh, to people in a certain area to move away from that, and now uh, it is up to them to uh, obey that uh, uh, order or to stay where they are and risk whatever will happen as a result of it to them. I have no idea what the plan is, but I think that it is also uh, directed to the leadership of Hamas. 
because they are responsible for this. They are responsible for the lives of their citizens. And they have brought this about upon the, the south of Israel. And if they do not behave properly at this stage, then all the deaths that will now uh, happen in the Gaza Strip will, because of the, the, will be because of the behavior of the Hamas leadership, none less and none more. Ephraim Halevi, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And let's stay on this with NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, thank you very much for joining us this morning. So a big story, as we were just hearing there, this order of evacuation in Gaza by Israel's military. UN rights groups say it's simply impossible to evacuate a million Palestinians in 24 hours, saying it's going to have devastating humanitarian consequences and that really there's nowhere for them to go or no way for them to get somewhere else. What is your reaction to this, both the warning and then how difficult it would be to heed that warning? Well, the IDF has said 24 hours, but it may or may not be 24 hours. Uh, they may wait until uh, several days. Uh, but the one independent variable is whether or not the IDF thinks that it has uh, denigrated Hamas uh, leadership and infrastructure in northern Gaza sufficiently to permit an invasion. Uh, it, it might take more than 24 hours, but the 24-hour uh, uh, warning was evidently to get the Gazans to move south. And the images we're seeing right now are the flyers that were sent into Gaza warning people uh, from Israel. So, Colonel, if this is indeed laying the groundwork for this ground invasion, how do you think it is going to unfold once it starts? Well, the, they told them to go south of the Wadi, which is about a third of the way down the Gaza Strip. Uh, evidently, uh, IDF intelligence has produced... Uh, information that indicates that a large proportion of Hamas leadership is still remaining in the northern part uh, of Gaza. Now, the, uh, Hamas has told the Gazans not to follow that order, and one can come to the inexorable conclusion that that's because Hamas would like to see as many of its own citizens uh, hurt in the Israeli attack. Uh, but Israel will attack and will uh, take back all of the area from the border down to the wadi, but it's not going to be easy because of all the rubble in the streets. Uh, the strength is with the defense in such an urban environment. Tanks are more or less useless in this kind of mm. environment, so it's going to be difficult. Also, Colonel, just quickly, we only have a few moments left here, but we did have this information coming from Hamas that some of the hostages have been killed in these strikes. How do you balance that with a ground invasion, not knowing where they are? Or what do you think is happening right now in terms of intelligence to understand where they are before this takes place? Well, intelligence is difficult to get inside Gaza. Uh, whatever informants uh, previously got information that, that probably no longer exist. Uh, there, I think Israel and most observers think that Israel will continue to pound Hamas locations uh, we have to be, and they are realistic about whether or not they'll be, ever, be able to get any of the hostages out uh, because Hamas has said they're not going to release them. All right, Colonel Jack Jacobs, thank you very much for joining us. Sure. Well, here closer to home, local and federal law enforcement agencies across the U.S. are stepping up their patrols of Jewish houses of worship, businesses, and Israeli diplomatic buildings. This is mainly because the former leader of Hamas has called for today to be a so-called global day of anger in support of the attack on Israel. Calls for attacks in the U.S. have intensified online in the past couple days. Officials say they're not taking any chances this weekend. We have directed the NYPD to surge additional resources to schools, houses of worship, to ensure that they are safe. There is currently no intelligence showing any active threats in New York. But in a moment fraught like this, we will continue to exercise elevated vigilance and impose measures to deter any potential violence. Historically, such <clears throat> calls for action or for a so-called day of rage have produced large demonstrations and unrest in other parts of the world, but have not led to large-scale attacks in the U.S. in the past. 
We have much more ahead here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, it is sure to be out of this world. We're going to tell you about the big lunar event that will have millions of people looking up this weekend. At first, though, after the break, Republicans back to square one in their search for a new House speaker. We will tell you why up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. It is back to the drawing board today for House Republicans. That's because House Majority Leader Steve Scalise dropped his bid to be the next House Speaker. The decision came just 24 hours after Scalise secured the GOP nomination, defeating Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan in a closed-door vote. House Republicans are set to meet again this morning to discuss their next steps. For Scalise, concerns were growing over whether he could win the speakership in a full House vote. He addressed reporters last night after a closed-door meeting with fellow Republicans. I'm withdrawing my name as a candidate for the speaker designee. Uh, if you look at over the last few weeks, if you look at where our conference is, there's still work to be done. Uh, our conference still has to come together and is not there. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now with the latest developments. Julie, good morning. So earlier this week, Scalise seemed confident he had enough support. Certainly not the case anymore. What happened behind closed doors that led to this decision? Yeah, well, Steve Scalise just couldn't get to 217. He remembered just one half of the votes, a little bit over than that from Jim Jordan, behind closed doors on Wednesday. He worked all of Wednesday night, all of Thursday, yesterday. We were outside multiple multi-hour conference meetings in which Scalise was working the room, working the phones. He was trying to meet with allies. He was trying to get uh, to pick off some of those no's. But in the end, he just couldn't get there. And there was some bad blood behind the scenes between him and Jim Jordan, Scalise uh, aides thinking that Jordan perhaps didn't work as hard to get Scalise uh, those votes to pick off some of his own support. Scalise in the end, of course, withdrawing his name. Now it's a big question mark of what happens next. Republicans are set to meet this morning at 10. But I got to tell you guys, it's not looking likely like a vote on the floor will happen anytime soon. So is Congressman Jim Jordan now the front runner for the job? Is anyone else emerging as a favorite? Yeah, that's the big question. Look, there are a few others throwing their hat in the ring, like Mike Johnson, for example, Congressman Byron Donalds, the freshman of Florida. But really, Jim Jordan here is considered the front runner. Remember, he still has the former president's backing. Jordan is really seen as somebody who can unify the hard right, the most conservative of the conference, certainly a problem uh, that Kevin McCarthy had when he was speaker, a problem Steve Scalise had in trying to pick off those votes. We're talking about such small numbers here. I mean, this is really just... 4% or so of the entire Republican conference. But with such a slim majority, it really shows you how every single vote counts. And there was so much frustration yesterday, cursing inside of the room, members coming out with high emotions, tensions flaring. I mean, this is really a Republican conference that is ungovernable at this point. Jordan, though, for his part, is still going to try to get the gavel, even after telling us since Wednesday he's not interested and he's all behind Scalise. We'll see what happens. All right, let's move briefly to the other chamber, talk about Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey, the Democrat, now facing new charges. We know he and his wife Nadine pleaded not guilty to corruption charges after they were accused of accepting bribes. So what is Senator Menendez accused of now? Well, there's a superseding indictment, again, charging Menendez with being a foreign agent. There's specific letters involved. They have photo proof, uh, specifically when it relates to the Egyptian government. So it's building really on more of the same. There's no new charges that they found additional cash uh, or those gold bars that they found in that, or in the, in that unsealed indictment initially uh, that came down last month. But Menendez, for his part, saying very defiant, saying he will continue to fight these charges. I talked to Cong uh, Senator Marco Rubio, who's the top Republican on the intelligence. Committee. Here's what he told me. What do you make of this? Do you think he I'm, should I don't resign? Know. I'm getting hearing it from you for the first time. So uh, if he wants to defend himself in court, he has the right to do so. And you know, in our country, the government is um, tasked with the job of proving those cases. Uh, you know, but um, but honestly, I hear about that for the first time. There's a lot going but on. Is in the it world, concerning? So. In general, I'm so sorry. We really do have to. Run. Yeah, I mean, I'm who's so in sorry. favor of that? I mean, I don't think. Of course, it's concerning, but Jim he has a right to defend himself. A position on the Intelligence Committee. He's also privy to some of the sensitive information that Menendez was as foreign relations chairman. For his part, though, he's saying Menendez has a right to defend himself, but certainly the more these charges come to light, the more Menendez continues to fight them. I expect more of his colleagues next week will continue to call for him uh, to resign. We already heard from Senator Fetterman, who wants him expelled. All right, Julie Serkin, a lot to cover this morning. Thank you so much.
Well, one of two Colorado police officers charged in the 2019 death of Elijah McLean has been found guilty. A jury convicted Aurora police officer Randy Rodema of criminally negligent homicide and third degree assault. His sentencing is set for January 5th. Former Aurora officer Jason Rosenblatt was acquitted. In 2019, McLean was walking away from a convenience store in Aurora when he was confronted by police after someone called 911 saying the 23-year-old seemed suspicious. Officers put him in a chokehold and paramedics gave him ketamine. McLean died in the hospital days later. Well, still to come, a look up for a can't-miss lunar event. Up next, we're going to tell you what makes this weekend's solar eclipse so special. And of course, no surprise here, another rainy weekend on tap for millions. We'll tell you who needs to keep the umbrella handy and when we'll finally see some sunshine coming up. Welcome back. It is going to be a rainy one this weekend for parts of the country. That's right. Angie Lassman has the latest. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. And you're exactly right. The rain is going to be something you'll deal with if you're in the Midwest today and if you're in the Northeast tomorrow and potentially on Sunday. So let's start in the Midwest and parts of the Great Lakes. That's where we see plenty of moisture working through this morning. And we do have a couple of rumbles of thunder happening just north of Omaha. Uh, this is going to be something that we see working its way a little farther to the east with this system, taking all that rain with it throughout the day today. So places like Chicago, Green Bay, Minneapolis, Detroit, stretching down into portions of Ohio will continue to see impressive rainfall rates and the potential for some localized flooding. As we get into tomorrow, it starts to move, work its way a little farther to the east. It brings all that rain to really portions of the northeast. I think places like Boston and points north will actually see some drier conditions. We're not looking at quite a soggy weekend there. But New York, Philadelphia will even still be dealing with some of these showers lingering into Sunday. So the umbrella is handy for sure in that region for Saturday. Today, though, the umbrella is handy across the, the Great Lakes and, and the upper Midwest. We've got the potential for flooding in places like Chicago stretching to Des Moines. That's where we'll see those really impressive rainfall rates. The flooding concern will be there with anywhere from an inch to two inches of rain in some of the higher spots uh, over uh, the next couple of days. And behind that system, we're going to be left behind with some really windy conditions. We've got some wind alerts up and check out these peak wind speeds that we're expecting through the next couple of days. 55 miles per hour in Dodge City. You can see high 20s, high 30s across this region. So It'll be quite gusty and something we'll have to watch for uh, through at least the next couple of days. Meanwhile, yes, the rain in the northeast, but plenty of sunshine out west, guys. And it'll be mild across portions of the Rockies. So the rest of the country looking pretty good. Yeah. All right, not bad. Probably split. Yeah. <laughs> Horrible one. All right, Angie, thank you so much. No well, millions of people across the U.S. will be looking to the sky this weekend because an annular eclipse, also known as the Ring of Fire, will mm. be moving across <laughs> much of the southwest tomorrow afternoon. Let's bring in former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino for more. He is also a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia University and a senior advisor for the space programs at the Intrepid Museum and one of our favorite guests here. Yes. Mike, good to have you with us. So let's start with the science here. What's happening during this eclipse on Saturday? What can we expect to see in the skies? Well, uh, good to see both of you, uh, Joe and Savannah. Um, it, it's, it's really a, a very cool cosmic event that's taking place. They take place at a total eclipse or this type of eclipse, an annual eclipse or a total eclipse where everything aligns, happens about twice a year. Uh, this one, as you said, is the ring of fire or annular, which means that the moon and its orbit around the earth is at its apogee, which means it's furthest from the earth or closer furthest from the earth when this is gonna be taking place, which means it's a little smaller in the sky than when we have a total eclipse. So that it doesn't totally block out the sun. It'll be blocking out the sun in such a way about 90% of it so that you see that ring of fire around it. And as I said, we have these about twice a year, um, but they rarely come over a place where people live. They typically happen over the ocean because oh. the earth is mostly ocean or in inhabited areas. So that's what makes this one unique. So what parts of the country are going to get the best view of the eclipse? And, and you said maybe it's gonna be a while before we're actually able to see another one? Yeah, maybe we got, well, we're kind of lucky here in the United States. We're just dealing in the U.S. because we have another one coming in 2024. We had a, a total eclipse, uh, the Great American Eclipse, they called it. The Great American mm -hmm. Eclipse was back in 2017. But for this one, um, the best place to get in that 90% where it's the annual, the, the total annularity area there, that, 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 that path, it's going to start in the Pacific Northwest up in Oregon and then go across the country Southwest. Roswell, New Mexico, those kind of down to uh, the Midland, Texas, and then exit out through Texas. The best place, though, to, to find this out is to look online or in the newspaper or someplace 
where you can see the map and see where you live and where would be a good place to go to get to the closest area. And maybe you're lucky enough to live in that annularity path. But even if you don't, if you're in some other places uh, that it kind of spreads out from that line from Oregon down to Texas, as you spread out across the country, you'll still get to see something. And in New York, for example, where we are, it's going to be about a 30 percent occlusion of oh. the of the sun, oh. which means about 30 percent of the sun is going to be covered. A chunk of it's going to be missing if, when when you, you have to observe carefully, though. But a, ch a chunk of the sun will be missing because it's going to be blocked by the by the moon. So anywhere you are. Uh, you'll, if you want to get the best view, you have to be in that path of annularity, so to speak. But anywhere you are, you can look up at the right time hmm. with the right eye protection and yeah. enjoy it. I wanted to ask, I'm thinking back to 2017, those precautions we yeah. took real quickly here. Remind us what yeah. we should do to stay safe. Well, number one, don't look at it directly. And, be, and don't look at it with just a regular pair of sunglasses. Again, you can find things out online where near you, you might be able to acquire a, a new pair. Don't use old ones either because these things get broken. Or they get they get old. They don't work as well. I'm talking about these like cardboard things that that are that are sold or given away in some cases to block out the harmful rays of the sun. So make sure you have the right eye protection. Get a pair of those approved glasses if possible. It looks like a sci-fi movie. Everybody <laughs> looking up yeah. wearing these so cute. All right, Mike Massimino, fun stuff. Thank you so much. You well, bet. coming Thanks up, tiny green tiles bringing thousands of people together. Up next, we're going to explain how a centuries-old game is getting some renewed attention thanks to a group of friends here in New York. This is Morning News Now. We're back with financial headlines now. Microsoft's two-year quest to buy Activision now coming to a close. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other headlines. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, finally, Microsoft getting the green light from UK regulators for its $69 billion takeover of the video game company Activision Blizzard. The move clears the way for Microsoft to close the deal, which would officially bring World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, and other games under the technology giant's control. Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems are expanding the scope of their inspections involving a recently discovered production defect affecting 737 MAX 8 aircrafts. In August, the plane maker identified an issue with improperly drilled holes on the aft pressure bulkhead made by its supplier, Spirit Aerosystems. The initial search focuses only on holes made with an automated drill. Now, the company is inspecting hand-drilled holes as well. According to a report from the trade publication, the air current shares of both companies slipping pre-market as investors worry the problem could lead to delivery delays. And NBA stars Shaquille O'Neal and Allen Iverson will serve as Reebok's president and vice president of basketball. The shoe company is working to rebuild its reputation in team sports after being acquired by Authentic Brands Group last year. Reebok is expecting to relaunch Reebok Basketball in early 2025. Looking forward to that. Cool. Silvana Hanel, yeah. thank you so much. Head to a little friendly competition. A 200-year-old game called Mahjong is gaining some new life thanks to four friends. They all went to the University of Texas in Austin, but they actually didn't meet until they started playing the mm. game right here in New York. What started with four people has now grown to nearly 4,000. They invited me to give the game a shot. It's a game that connects players to their culture and to each other. Mahjong, which was the backdrop for a pivotal scene in the movie Crazy Rich Asians. These days, the green tile is in style. Mahjong is having a bit of a renaissance. Honestly, I think it's because at its core, Mahjong is a very simple game and a very social game. And it's just the ultimate connector. It's why Joe Shu, Ernie Chan, Sarah Tang, and Grace Liu created the Green Tile Social Club, which didn't start as a club. It started with a simple Instagram story. Hungry to play Mahjong, he's down to learn. At first, four of them gathered for a weekly game night. And that slowly just like grew and grew. Like we put some of our stories and people were like, wait, I wanna learn how to play, or I've been like looking for this. Before you knew it, they had an Instagram account, then a logo, then a name, all promoting their meetups. What does that say, the fact that it's grown so quickly? It says that Mahjong is back. <laughs> I think it speaks a lot to young Asian Americans like us looking for that community and looking to connect back to our roots and culture. Many grew up watching their parents and grandparents play, and it was serious business. And one day, I finally got the approval to have my own seat <laughs> at the table. You have to get approval? Once they think you know what you're doing, 
They're like, okay, you can have your own seat. <laughs> of course, that's not everyone's experience. I didn't learn until recently. For a lot of my life, like, I was always too intimidated. And then it wasn't until I came to New York and I met all of us together, like, they taught me how to play. Grace is far from alone. That's why the club focuses on teaching newcomers. I'm new. Am I going to be okay? You're going to be just yeah. fine. Even teaching me. The name of the game in Mahjong is to create a winning hand. I was joined by a couple fellow novices. Have you been dying to play? I've been dying to play. I'm so excited for this. We listened intently as Joe showed us how the game bears some resemblance to poker. Instead of a deck of cards, you've got a wall of tiles. After a quick lesson, 90,000. East. Oh, nice. <laughs> we were playing. Whiteboard. Fortune. Six of high. I pump. Yes. <laughs> Woohoo! And catching on. Uh, north. Making it accessible at all levels is key to attracting so many players. A lot of people come in and they meet people. By the end of meetup, they're all exchanging numbers, social handles, and then we end up seeing them all like hanging out outside of our events as well. Word travels so fast, it recently reached a surprising name. SNL's Bowen Yang showed up. Yeah. <laughs> Did that blow your yeah. mind? <laughs> the craziest <laughs> moment ever. And he showed up on time, right at the start, stayed through the entire event played with us. What did that tell you? We're a big deal, I guess. <laughs> so big, Ember Lowe brought her mom, who was visiting from China. How much is mom helping you here today? Uh, we've only won one so far, actually, out of like five games. <laughs> Still, that family connection is important. Just ask Lenny on. For me, it's a way to connect with my grandma because she has Alzheimer's and she says, it helps keep her wits a lot. So when we're doing it, when we're playing, it kind of really helps keep her mind sharp. That must mean a lot to you. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. These green clad tiles are not building walls. They're tearing them down. In doing so, keeping hundreds of years of tradition alive too, you know, and making sure that we can pass it down to the next generation just like our parents and our grandparents did and keeping it alive. So the club generally holds one big meetup each month with some smaller events for more experienced players each month as well. The founders say they want to keep growing, turn the club into a small business. They're trying to raise funds so they can hold even more events in more places all around New York. I love it. I want to learn. I know. It's cool. And it's pretty easy to learn. It took, yeah. I tried the day before. I tried to teach myself. <laughs> that was that not great, so but it prepared me to learn from them. They're great teachers. Yeah. So. Oh, so much fun. And Bo and Yang, there you go. Know, they cool are a big that? deal. I love yeah. that. All right. Coming up, Swifties. Are you ready for it? That's right. Taylor Swift is now in her blockbuster era and expected to top the box office this weekend with her Eras Tour movie. I got more on all the excitement next on Morning News News. We end this hour with the woman who continues to dominate pop culture and my heart for that matter, Taylor Swift. The superstar's Eras Tour film opened in theaters last night to sold out screenings across the country a day early than it was supposed to. But her big box office debut did not stop Swift from making an appearance at the Kansas City Chiefs games to cheer on Travis Kelsey once again. Today's show anchor Chanel Jones has the details. That magical Taylor touch. Once again, the pop superstar on site cheering the Chiefs to victory over the Broncos Thursday night. This Swift's third appearance at a game, intensifying attention on her relationship with Kansas City tight end Travis Kelsey. It was the icing on a very sweet week for the pop superstar, enchanting fans on the red carpet at her Eras Tour movie premiere Wednesday. I've never had a fraction of the amount of fun I had on the Eras tour. Swift then opening the film Thursday night, a day early, due to unprecedented demand. I'm going to go to this movie at least 13 times. As soon as I found out, I was like, we have to go like today. Audiences bringing that Swifty spirit inside, dancing and singing in their seats, just like Taylor did at the premiere. What did you say? The film already breaking records, earning more than $100 million worldwide in advanced ticket sales, making it the best opening ever for a concert film and projected to be among the highest grossing movies of the year. Of course, there's been concert films before, but never like at the level of Taylor. Instead of using a major studio to shoot and release the movie, Swift blazing another new trail 
going directly to AMC theaters to distribute the film. An unheard of move. The blockbuster film coming on top of her live tour, the most successful in history, predicted to earn a staggering $4 billion. With her movie spreading to even more screens today, one thing's for sure, Swift's not-so-cruel summer is turning into a red hot fall. Ugh, I can't wait to see it. Our thanks to Chanel Jones for that reporting. Here's some more good news for Swifties. The remake of Swift's smash album, 1989, is coming out again at the end of this Do you month. have your tickets? I do. Okay. I do have my tickets. All right. We expect I a full wait. review. Yes. You got it. All right. That's <laughs> going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Top of the hour, let's get right to the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. This morning, growing signs of a possible Israeli ground assault on Gaza. The IDF now ordering a little more than a million citizens out of northern Gaza to evacuate. Hamas pushing back, urging the population to stay where they are. The UN also renouncing the move, citing the risk of humanitarian disaster. Overnight, another show of America's steadfast support for Israel as Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin lands in Tel Aviv. He is expected to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The war's death toll still on the rise this morning with more than 2,800 people now dead across the region. And the shockwaves are being felt far beyond the Middle East as law enforcement in several American cities steps up security around synagogues and Jewish-owned businesses in response to a surge of anti-Semitic chatter online. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin our coverage this hour with NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel, who has this report from the Israel-Gaza border. There is now desperation in Gaza as Israel has told Palestinians that they have until midnight tonight local time to evacuate Gaza City. That is the city right behind me and all of the northern Gaza Strip to save their lives. The IDF calls for the evacuation of all civilians from Gaza City. Israel overnight warned more than one million Palestinians to evacuate their homes within 24 hours as it continues to attack the Gaza Strip and cut it off. Israel says it had no choice but to attack Gaza to disarm and deter Hamas after its gunmen butchered 1,300 Israelis and foreigners and kidnapped upwards of 150. And it's flattening the Gaza Strip to do it, with around-the-clock airstrikes and tanks taking up positions and opening fire. Israel says it only targets Hamas. But what about the children? 40% of the 2 million Gazans are under 15. The UN says a humanitarian crisis is dire and getting worse. Hospitals in Gaza are overwhelmed with thousands of dead and wounded. Doctors are running out of supplies and Israel has cut the power and water. As I'm speaking, there is bombing everywhere around the hospital. The building is shaking every minute or two minutes. Uh, I don't know if we are going to see another day. And uh, I hope my family is going okay. Israeli troops and heavy weapons are now ringing Gaza. A ground assault could come soon. The brunt of it, it seems, will come from the north. So as you can see, over, we're all preparing our bags and leaving our house. Salma Shirab so is a 22-year-old dental student. Uh, no one has a place right now. If you have a car, just run. No one knows where we're going. But we're all evacuating. Prime Minister Netanyahu says Hamas is like ISIS and released graphic photographs of children killed and mutilated by Hamas terrorists. He showed them to Secretary of State Blinken, who today traveled from Israel to Jordan on a mission to prevent the war from spreading across the region. Hamas has told Palestinians to defy Israel's orders, but many are leaving. Some, however, are staying in Gaza, particularly medical officials who said they have a moral obligation to stay behind. All right, Richard Engel, thank you very much. Stay safe. For more, we're joined by NBC News military analyst and Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, thanks for joining us again. So with Israel seemingly poised for this ground invasion of Gaza, what can we expect to see in the coming days and weeks? Yeah, Israel uh, said 24 hours, but it, uh, it, I think most people would be surprised if it happened that soon. Uh, 
if you're an attacker, you do it uh, at the time of your choosing. And one of the things that's most important to the IDF is to have some confidence uh, that uh, Hamas uh, communications capabilities, command and control, uh, has been uh, degraded to the point uh, where it will be easier for the IDF to find individual pockets of Hamas and, and, and eliminate them. But this is not going to be easy. As we saw, there's a great deal of rubble in the streets. If you're uh, fighting in built-up terrain, in urban terrain, the advantage is to the defender. And in addition to that, although Israel has warned Gazans to leave the area and go south of the Wadi, about a third of the way down, uh, down the strip, uh, Hamas has said, has told uh, its citizens to stay in place. Uh, obviously, as a, uh, to, to ensure that a, a large proportion of the people who remain there, uh, the civilians, uh, become casualties, which works to, to Hamas's, uh, Hamas's advantage. Nevertheless, at some juncture, it's likely that the IDF is going to go in there. We saw a lot of tanks there. Tanks are tough to use in urban terrain, especially in uh, especially where there's so much rubble. Tanks are more useful up in the north against Hezbollah on the border with Lebanon, where the terrain is more open. Uh, but whether or not the uh, crossing the border is going to take place in 24 hours or a week's time, uh, nobody but the IDF knows, Joe. So since, hey, it's Savannah, Colonel, um, since the use of tanks would be difficult given the terrain. What does that mean you think that this would look like? Is this hand-to-hand -hand combat? What would it look like in an urban area? Well, I and a lot of my comrades fought in urban terrain at difficult times in Vietnam. Uh, small individual units down to squad level, 10 soldiers or fewer, going street to street and house to house. Don't forget that Hamas has uh, bunkers has, is, is underground. A, a lot of its uh, capability is underground, which, which may be uh, why it's going to take longer for Israel to, uh, uh, to get into Gaza, because the bombing not necessarily has, uh, has degraded Hamas's capability because they're underground. But it's, it's extremely difficult, a large number of casualties. The three to one ratio typically one needs for uh, an attacker against the defender mm. goes up to four or five or more to one if you're fighting in urban terrain with a lot of rubble. Extremely difficult. And that's one of the reasons why Netanyahu and the IDF say, uh, get ready for a, a long, drawn-out affair, mm. As Richard Engel mentioned, Secretary Blinken is trying to prevent, really, the war from spreading across the region. Colonel, the longer the conflict goes on in Gaza, does that make it more or less likely for others to get involved, like Hezbollah? Well, probably more likely. Uh, Hezbollah, of course, is an arm of Iran, and it's really a function of what Iran wants to do with Hezbollah. One of the reasons we have um, the carrier strike force, the Ford carrier, uh, carrier strike force in the eastern Mediterranean is to demonstrate that, uh, that the United States will get involved if necessary, if American assets, allied assets, are threatened by by Iran, Syria, or any other actor in the region. But the longer this goes on, the more likely it is that other, others will be involved, either uh, uh, large-scale organizations like Hezbollah, which is a far stronger, militarily, a far stronger force than Hamas, uh, or, or other actors in the region. Uh, uh, Iran, in particular, we're most concerned about Iran, but the longer, the longer this goes on, the more likely it is somebody, including anybody uh, motivated by Iran, will take action. So Israel's prime minister has said here that the goal is to wipe out Hamas, that that's how this ends it, from their perspective. But what does that ultimately mean for the leadership of Gaza? In addition to being this terrorist organization, as many countries recognize Hamas, it's also the political party in charge there. Where would that leave Gaza? Yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that's a seminal question. Uh, first of all, tactically and strategically, if you're Israel and you go in there, you don't want to stay there forever. Uh, Israel's been in Gaza before and left. 
Uh, you've got uh, two million people in a very small area. You don't want to govern them. You want to leave. You just want to eliminate the threat to Israel. Uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the Abbas, uh, with whom Blinken met, is, is roundly despised in Gaza. Uh, Hamas is the leadership there. Getting rid of Hamas is not as easy as it sounds unless you change the dynamic inside Gaza. Uh, people have tried to do that. Palestinians have tried to do that for a long period of time. And what you see, what, you, what we've all seen in the last week is the result of those attempts. They've all failed. At the end of the day, almost anything successful takes good leadership, whether it's in the United States, or any other place for that matter, including Gaza, it takes good leadership. Without good, good leadership, what you see is uh, carnage, uh, uh, destruction, and the hopes of people on both sides of the border dashed. What do you see is gonna be America's role in all of this now moving forward? Well, we're gonna to continue to support uh, uh, with materiel and, uh, and money and other ways, we're gonna to continue to support Israel. I, I, it is difficult to envision how we would not do that in the face of such, such horrific, horrific uh, images that we saw, the, uh, the, uh, the animal. Uh, anyway, we, it, it's very difficult to envision that we're going to abandon Israel. But Israel needs to have a longer-term plan for what it's going to do other than go into Gaza and have a sh relatively short-term victory against Hamas. So there needs to be some sort of consensus on what's going to happen, which is one reason why Secretary Blinken spent some time with Arab leaders. At the end of the day, it's going to take leadership among Arab leaders to have some positive effect on what happens in Gaza. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not that's going to happen. Uh, you asked about what happens if this takes a long time to resolve. The good side of that is the longer this takes, the more likely it is that Arab leaders in the region might coalesce into assisting Israel and the United States and Gazans to coming some, to some sort of peaceful conclusion to all this for a long term. All right. Colonel Jack Jacobs, as always, I appreciate your analysis and expertise. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Very much. Thank you. Here in New York and in many other cities nationwide, law enforcement is stepping up security at synagogues and Jewish-owned businesses as calls for attacks on the Jewish community intensify online. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on that. Stephanie, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. You know, we've been watching that security ramp up at synagogues like this one and other Jewish locations all week long. Now we're being told that there are some schools that have closed today or gone remote out of an abundance of caution. All of this after a former Hamas leader called for protests around the world today. This morning at synagogues and Jewish schools and businesses nationwide, security is beefed up. According to multiple law enforcement officials, authorities are monitoring increased threats online, but adding none of them are specific and credible. One major cause for concern, the former head of Hamas calling for a global day of anger today against Israel, encouraging neighboring countries to join the fight. We've had moments of elevated security risk with specific concerns about the Jewish community in the past. Is this moment different? This moment is very different. This is unprecedented. Former New York City Police Chief Terry Monahan says law enforcement is keeping a sharp eye out for any threats. But they're also asking the public to be vigilant and report anything suspicious. This is the biggest risk that uh, I think law enforcement has been faced when it comes towards the idea of counterterrorism since 9-11. It all comes as protests have popped up this week in cities and on college campuses, occasionally becoming flashpoints between pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian demonstrators. On New York's Long Island, police briefing rabbis about their security plans as the Jewish community prepares for the first Sabbath and Saturday services since Hamas's deadly attack. We're not going to allow fear to paralyze us. It's never good to do that. One rabbi whose congregation includes more than 1,200 families says their doors will be open this weekend. I encourage our Jewish population, who usually doesn't come to synagogue this Sabbath, come out strong and let everyone know that just because Hamas tries to eradicate jury from this world, it's not going to happen. 
The NYPD is investigating multiple incidents in the city, including an assault and arrest at Columbia University. That school actually shut down its campus to the public. They're also keeping an eye on a pro-Palestinian rally that is set to take place in Times Square today, and you can expect a significant police presence there, Joe. So, Stephanie, what exactly are these counterterrorism units looking for when it comes to the online threats? Well, Joe, you know, we've been talking a lot this week about, about chatter being increased online. They have noticed that there are more threats, anti-Semitic threats online, but what they are looking for is what they call a specific and credible threat. That's actually a, a, a terminology that they use. Uh, that's when they elevate the threat. They're looking for specific locations and dates and if they see something like that that's when their threat is elevated it's also worth pointing out that these counterterrorism units are doing their own on the gr ground investigation talking to their sources talking to people in neighborhoods to hear what they're what they're hearing that's all right stephanie goss thank you so much well as stephanie just mentioned in her piece tensions are rising across college campuses as more students voice their views on the war in the middle east some say they feel unsafe showing their support while at one university it may have cost a professor their job nbc news correspondent valerie castro tells us more the israel hamas war stoking protests across the u.s at various college campuses in the northeast a pro-palestinian demonstration at brooklyn college and at Columbia University, massive crowds as supporters of both Israel and Palestinians held competing protests. Columbia, Columbia, open your eyes. In the nation's capital, American University students gathering in solidarity with Israel. The horror has reached an unimaginable level. While supporters of Palestinians made their presence known. No one in hell. It's scary. I mean, I walked up here with my flag on and I instantly took it off because you know, people are telling you to be careful. At UNC Chapel Hill, tensions boiling between supporters of the two sides. <laughs> Arizona State University Students for Justice in Palestine holding a rally today outside the student union, one day after the school's Hillel Jewish organization held a vigil in support of Israel. The school acknowledging the distress and concern caused by the week's events in a statement. But some Jewish students say it doesn't go far enough. There was no real statement saying what happened was wrong, which I think is stressing out a lot of the Jewish students. A war of words also playing out in statements from student groups and university's leadership. The University of Florida president issuing a viral statement saying in part, quote, there is no defense for terrorism. This shouldn't be hard. The NYU Law Student Bar Association president possibly out of a campus title and future job offer at a law firm for writing Israel bears full responsibility for Hamas's attack in a weekly bulletin, leaving some of the school's Jewish community on edge. So I've honestly been avoiding campus. I didn't go to class this afternoon. The Student Bar Association voting to start the president's removal process as a result, and NYU condemning the terrorist attack on Israel in a statement. At Harvard, it's Palestinian solidarity groups initially releasing a joint statement holding the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all the unfolding violence. At the end of the day, this is a group that seeks the destruction of the Jewish race, and it's not the right time to be um, issuing a pro-Palestinian statement. Backlash quickly ensued. A professor posting a photo of a truck driving around campus showing photos, which he redacted, of some of the students who signed the statement. Some groups formally apologizing and retracting their signatures while over 4,000 members of the Harvard community signed a counter statement. There's a lot of like tension, a lot of people have missed class. Harvard's president condemning the terrorist atrocities perpetuated by Hamas, emphasizing that the student body does not speak for Harvard University. I feel like Harvard um, very visibly and loudly stood by Israel, but I don't hear the same frustration for the, the blood that's been shed for the Palestinians. Students across the country wondering whose voices will be loudest. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that reporting. Turning now to how this war is playing out in American politics, former President Trump is facing backlash after criticizing Israel's prime minister and appearing to praise Hezbollah, another terror group fighting Israeli forces. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns reports on the fiery, fiery response from one of his top 2024 Republican rivals. Well, thank you very much. Wow.
Former President Trump once again at the center of a political firestorm. The 2024 GOP primary frontrunner igniting controversy by blasting Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as his country reels from Hamas's unprecedented attack. I'll never forget that Bibi Netanyahu let us down. That was a very terrible thing. The comments a reference to the U.S. operation to kill Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, which Trump says Israel backed out of. The former president expressed support for Israel and pledged to stand with them if he's reelected, but criticized the country's intelligence operation for failing to anticipate the attack. You talk about the intelligence or you talk about some of the things that went wrong over the last week. Uh, they've got to straighten it out because they're fighting potentially a very big force. During his speech to supporters in Florida, Trump seeming to praise Hezbollah, an Islamist military group and a U.S. designated terror organization. And then two nights ago, I read all of Biden's security people. Can you imagine? National defense people. And they said, gee, I hope Hezbollah doesn't attack from the north because that's the most vulnerable spot. I said, wait a minute. You know, Hezbollah is very smart. They're all very smart. One of Trump's 2024 rivals, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, firing back with his toughest criticism yet of the frontrunner. Writing on X, it is absurd that anyone, much less someone running for president, would choose now to attack our friend and ally, Israel, much less praise Hezbollah terrorists as very smart. As president, I will stand with Israel and treat terrorists like the scum that they are. Nobody. We spoke with DeSantis after he filed for the ballot in New Hampshire, where the nation's first Republican primary will be held in just three months. Former President Trump was critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu. What do you make of those comments? And having yourself been to Israel and met with Netanyahu, what do you make of his leadership, uh, especially in this moment of crisis? Now is not the time to be attacking our ally. Prime Minister Netanyahu is somebody that I've become friends with. You may have a personal vendetta or beef with him, but is that really the time to be out there doing that and to be attacking the Israeli defense minister? I don't think so. A White House spokesman also rebuking Trump's remarks, calling them dangerous and unhinged. The Trump campaign firing back, saying in a statement, President Trump was clearly pointing out how incompetent Biden and his administration were by telegraphing to the terrorists an area that is susceptible to an attack. Smart does not equal good. It just proves Biden is stupid. Our thanks to Dasha Burns for that report. Florida Governor DeSantis signed an executive order Thursday to rescue Floridians in Israel. That order would enable the Florida Division of Emergency Management to transport folks home and provide necessary supplies to Israel. Coming up, chaos on Capitol Hill this morning. Yeah, Congressman Steve Scalise drops out of the race for House Speaker. So what happens next? We'll take you to Washington after this. We are back now with more uncertainty this morning on Capitol Hill as House Republicans once again find themselves looking for a new House Speaker nominee. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise withdrew his name after meeting last night with fellow Republicans behind closed doors. He became the party's nominee for Speaker just on Wednesday, but it did become clear he didn't have the votes needed to be elected. House Republicans are set to meet again today to discuss what happens next. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles uh, you have been just watching this around the clock. I know he joins us from Washington with the latest, the surprise that we got last night. Hey, Ryan, good morning. Yeah, Savannah, it's still a mess. Uh, right now, Republicans do not have a candidate to become the next Speaker of the House. They will meet today to try and hash things all out. But right now, there is no clear path forward. After weeks of countless closed-door meetings and constant infighting, Republicans in Congress are now looking to the heavens for answers. We're a ship that doesn't have a rudder right now, and I'm thoroughly disappointed in the process. And I just pray to God that we find something. That something is one person who can marshal the support of 217 Republicans in Congress. A goal so elusive that Steve Scalise, the man who once had the most support, just gave up. Our conference still has to come together and is not there. Uh, there are still some people that have their own agendas. The Republican civil war is so grave that it has hobbled the entire Congress. No legislation can emerge from the Capitol without a speaker in place. And that means the debate over funding to aid Israel, new policies to deal with the ongoing border crisis, and a looming government shutdown have not even started. We need to make sure that we are functional for, uh, for this country, and we're going to do that. It's a numbers game for Republicans. 
There are currently 433 sitting members of Congress. 212 of those seats belong to Democrats. Republicans have a majority with 221 seats. But in order to be elected speaker, you need to reach a magic number of 217. Meaning if all the Democrats and just five Republicans don't vote for the chosen candidate, a speaker can't be elected. It was enough to end Kevin McCarthy's speakership and prevent Scalise from getting there. And it remains a major barrier for other potential candidates like Jim Jordan as well. We're going to have the same problem with Jordan that we had with Scalise. So I think it's a math problem, frankly. Uh, and Savannah, I am not a math expert, so this is not a good situation for a Capitol Hill correspondent to be in. But we do think that Jim Jordan it will be the next man up. He is expected to at least make it clear whether or not he would like to make a run for the speakership later today. House Republicans expected to meet later this morning. But as it stands right now, there is no Speaker of the House, and that means nothing is getting done on Capitol Hill. Savannah. Ryan, I cannot help you out with the math, even in the slightest, but we appreciate your constant updates. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Some cool temps and rainy weather will come to parts of the country this weekend. That's right, Angie. Last Minute is back and tracking it all. Hey, Angie. Hey there, guys. Good morning to you. We've got the rain, of course. That's going to be the big story that we deal with today through at least Sunday across parts of the country. Today, it's focused across parts of the Midwest. The Great Lakes getting in on the action as well. And notice, we've got some pretty heavy rain that has been falling across this region since the early hours of the morning. We've got some thunderstorms that have been quite active in parts of Nebraska, Iowa. We're going to continue to see that heavy rain across, this, uh, across that area here at least through the day today. For that reason, we're expecting multiple rounds of some of that really heavy rain to potentially cause some problems when it comes to flash flooding. Where you see that darker shaded blue, that's where we have a better chance uh, of seeing that occur through the day today. So Chicago, Davenport, Des Moines, all included in that. We do have Milwaukee stretching down to Springfield, Grand Rapids included as well. So those spots you're going to want to watch uh, for some concerns when it comes to flooding. And we've got plenty of rain on the way, an inch to maybe two inches. Chicago could pick up maybe an inch and a half. We see parts of Michigan with an inch or so. Uh, and even stretching into portions of the Northeast as we get gear up for a wet day tomorrow and Sunday, we'll get some additional rainfall across that region. So let's talk about that region. It's been a while since we've seen some dry skies across some spots. I, I mean, uh, specifically on the weekends. I mean, Boston has been about eight weeks since we've seen a dry weekend. We'd have to go back to late August to see that. Similar story for New York and Philadelphia. About six weeks ago was the last time we had dry conditions on the weekend. So here's the deal. We're going to get some dry spots. Not so much on Saturday and Sunday if you live in Philadelphia and New York. It'll be pretty cloudy, pretty rainy. That, that moisture that's over the Midwest will start to work its way closer to us uh, and there. And then we'll see that isolated shower kind of still linger in the forecast for Sunday. But there will be periods of drier skies, and we're going to improve by the time the weekend is rounding out. Places like Hartford, you'll see some clouds and sprinkles on the back end of the weekend. But notice Boston. You're finally going to get a nice weekend, mostly sunny to partly sunny Saturday and Sunday. It'll be quite nice with temperatures as well. Now, Temperature-wise, over on the western half of the country, we've got 6 million people under these frost and freeze alerts, with temperatures dipping down into the 30s in places like Casper, Aspen at 33 degrees, Moab at 45 degrees, so a chill in the air for sure. This is all in the wake of that front. You add on those gusty winds that we're going to deal with 20, 30, maybe even 40 miles per hour, and it's going to be a little brisk as you get out the door this morning, but it doesn't improve a whole lot in some spots this afternoon. Denver, you're only going to get into the low 50s. That'll be 10 to 15 degrees below normal for you. Notice the difference as we look a little farther to the south and east. We've got St. Louis in the 70s. Cincinnati will hit 81 degrees through the day today. And as that front starts to move its way to the east and bring the rain to parts of the northeast, we're going to see the chilly temperatures settle in there as well. So that means that we'll end up with 57 degrees in Chicago tomorrow for your high. We'll see 50 53 for Buffalo, Washington, D.C. will drop uh, to temperatures into the low 60s. So that kind of cooler, more fall-like air will settle in. And it sticks with us even after the weekend. 55 degrees on Sunday in Chicago, Monday too. We don't warm up a whole lot by Tuesday. And it'll be a similar story uh, in New York. Low 60s, guys, on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. The rain will be gone, but mm. the 50s okay. <laughs> and the chilly kind of brisk weather will be left Love. behind. Okay, sweaters. I'm just happy that we're not in the flip-flopping anymore, you know, where then one day it's 80 degrees. Where 
you're sad you're not wearing flip flops? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you want the I'm chili. I'm happy water. to not be. Yes, I love it. I'm very excited. She's going to wear flip flops this weekend. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, because I'll be in Boston. All right, Angie Lawson, thank you. Yeah. Let's get you to some other international headlines now. A Russian TV journalist known for her on-air protest against the war in Ukraine now claims that she has been poisoned. NBC's Claudia Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world headlines. Claudia, good morning. Good morning, guys. That's right. French prosecutors are investigating uh, an allegation that a, uh, the former uh, Russian journalist who became famous for uh, denouncing the war in Iraq live on television was poisoned. Uh, now, the Paris prosecutor's office said Marina Osyanikova called emergency services after sudden, suddenly falling ill and said she suspected she was poisoned. She was hospitalized and an investigation is underway. Now to Haiti, where the conflict over the construction of the canal continues. Yesterday, just a day after the Dominican Republic government partially reopened its borders, Haiti refused to join their neighbors on reopening a key commercial border crossing, prolonging a diplomatic crisis and leaving some trade at a standstill. Officials said that in addition to keeping the border closed, they are working on a plan to allow Haitian uh, vendors to recover their goods stuck at the border marketplace since the closure. And we end up in Uruguay, where a manuscript of works by legendary Argentine writer Julio Cortazar has been auctioned for over $42,000. The typewritten manuscript had, uh, had a starting bid of $12,000. It contained 46 short stories, including seven unpublished works, and was purchased by an Argentinian buyer. Cortazar is one of Latin America's most celebrated writers, known for innovative narrative techniques that influenced future generations of writers. Back to you guys. All right. Unpublished stories. That's pretty cool. All Very right. Cool. Claudio, thank you so much. Thanks, Claudio. Coming up, a major strike setback in Hollywood as labor negotiations between the actors and the big studios are suspended indefinitely. So what led to this stalemate and how's it impacting shows like Saturday Night Live, which returns to the airwaves this weekend? We'll take a closer look next. Welcome back. Earlier this week, Jada Pinkett Smith shocked fans when she revealed that she has been separated and living apart from her husband, actor Will Smith, since 2016. Well, tonight for the first time, she's addressing the slap heard around the world when Smith assaulted Chris Rock at the Oscars last year. It's all part of Hoda Kotb's NBC News special, Jada's Story. Here's a preview. On Oscar night 2022, Will Smith slapped Chris Rock after Chris made a crack about Jada's hair. I could tell it bothered you. You, you did an eye roll. Like. Right. Yeah, and I did that eye roll not so much for me, and I think this is really important, but the fact that there could be a jab at alopecia. Will then went on a profane tirade warning Chris not to mention his wife's name. Jada couldn't believe what she was hearing. What is going on? Now, first of all, I'm really shocked because, mind you, I'm not there. We haven't called each other husband and wife yeah. in a long time. But I'm like, what is going on I right keep now? My wife's, wife's name. name out of your yes. mouth, yes. right? And I'm yes. like, but now I'm really worried for Will because I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. What viewers did not see at the time while Oscar clips were being shown was Chris Rock leaning over the stage to talk to Jada. And Chris looks to me and he says, Jada, I meant you, I meant no harm. Now, I, I'm just out of it because I yeah. really worried about and Will. And what's Will doing? He's just sitting there? And Will's still talking. He's like, oh. he's still, because now he's mad because Chris is talking to me. And I go, Chris, this is about some old sh That's all I could think to say, yeah. right? And I couldn't really take in his apology. How unusual for Will, a guy who I mean, on that kind of stage to do something so insane. Absolutely. It's totally it's out of not character. not him whatsoever. And to Jada's surprise, she was also blamed. You became the bad guy. Look yeah. what Jada made him do. Jada rolled her eyes and look what he did. He ran up there and hit Chris. Yeah. Poor Will. That's what the narrative became. Yeah. She says that's because two years earlier, Jada discussed what she called an entanglement on her show, Red Table Talk. My honest opinion about that is that narrative had more to do with the 
false narrative that I helped to create on the red table. So poor Will because of, of the... The adulterous wife. Yeah. Who forced him to go to the table and sit there you know what I mean? And now look at what she's done. She has the power with an eye roll to make him go up and slap somebody on stage. Thanks to Hoda Kotb for that report. Mm -hmm. You can catch Hoda's NBC News special, Jada's Story, tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. There you go. Well, there is a serious setback this morning in Hollywood. Negotiations in the ongoing actor strike have been suspended indefinitely. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas joins us now with the latest in all this. Chloe, good morning. Good morning. Well, that's right. The actors had been optimistic that they would be next after striking writers got back to work. But after five days at the bargaining table, negotiations, they've fallen apart, leaving Hollywood facing a very grim prospect that they could remain shut down through the holidays. It's so wrong and it's so unfair that they walked out of the meeting and so disrespectful. SAG after President Fran Drescher firing back at the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers and its CEO leaders for what she calls corporate greed. They talk at you. They really don't want to hear what you have to say or why you're saying it. On the picket lines, actors say they're disappointed but determined. So this is the part of the movie where the hero gets knocked down and you think they're out. And this is the part where you double down and you come back and win the day. The AMPTP, which represents streamers and major studios, including NBC's parent company, saying it is clear that the gap between the AMPTP and SAG-AFTRA is too great and conversations are no longer moving us in a productive direction. Compensation for streaming shows appears to be the major obstacle to a deal. The new Writers Guild contract includes a bonus system for hit shows and films. But Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos at Bloomberg's Screen Time Conference says a recent SAG-AFTRA proposal for what he called a levy on subscribers was a non-starter. It just felt uh, like a very like a bridge too far. The AMPTP says that this subscriber bonus sought by SAG-AFTRA could cost some $800 million per year and would create an untenable economic burden. But Drescher says that figure is greatly exaggerated. Have they said, though, what they would be willing to pay per subscriber, or is it a no-go? No, they walked away from the table. The two sides remain at odds on a range of other issues, including minimum salaries and protections around AI and consent. The impasse is pushing back release dates of several major films, including Dune 2 and Godzilla X-Kong, now reportedly scheduled for an April release. SNL will return with a new episode this Saturday night with Pete Davidson hosting. That's because sag after members who appear on that show are working under a different agreement and are not in violation of strike rules. That's how poor I was growing up. So the big question is, when are both sides going to be meeting again and there is no date on the table? Now, industry analysts say that the standoff means that production probably won't be able to start back until next year at the earliest. Ooh, so we heard a little bit of this in your piece, but what are actors on the picket line saying? I mean, a lot of them in NBC News, we've spoken to some of them, say that they want to hold out mm. for the deal that works best for them, that this is a pivotal moment. And Fran Drescher spoke to me last night saying that, you know, obviously there are a lot of things that are unprecedented right now. It's not just residuals in the streaming era. They are also far apart on key issues when it comes to protections around artificial intelligence. Mm, and Drescher yeah. also telling me that as the negotiations fell apart, that Ted Sarandos, uh, who runs Netflix, he walked out saying that he does not agree with their proposals on AI. So there are a lot of issues at stake and a lot of people waiting and hoping that there will be another meeting before we kick off this holiday season. Really interesting to just to get the anecdotes of how they even feel they're speaking to each other, the kind of the attitude in the room a little bit. Chloe Malas, thank you very much. Great reporting. Coming up, the rising tide. After the break, why cruise ship prices are surging in a post-pandemic world and how you can spot a bargain for your next getaway. That's next on Morning News Now. Back now with some financial headlines, starting with earnings from the big banks. NBC's Silvana Hanau is back with us with that and some other news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so B Wall Street is actually ready for a good open this morning on better than expected results from the nation's banks. J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo both reporting strong net interest income from higher interest rates. Now, investors were worried the banks would take a hit from the Fed's rate hikes, but so far, they seem to be mostly benefiting 
from monetary policy. Dollar General shares surging after the company said it was bringing back its former CEO, Todd Bezos, to run the company once again. Bezos will immediately take the helm, replacing Jeff Owen, who served in the role for less than a year. The discounter has faced slowing sales growth and allegations of unsafe working conditions. The company's board says the, quote, change in leadership is necessary to restore stability and confidence. And Tesla's foothold over the electric vehicle market slipped during the third quarter, despite U.S. sales of EVs topping 300,000 for the first time ever, according to a new report from Cox Automotive. Now, total EV sales rose nearly 50 percent during the quarter compared to a year ago. But Tesla's control of the EV market fell from 62 percent to 50 percent. The news comes despite the Elon Musk-led company cutting prices on its vehicles in an attempt to ramp up sales. I remember a time when only Tesla was available. Yeah. Many companies have, you know, have caught up a little bit. Yeah, people also don't like that wait list that <laughs> exactly. comes with getting a Tesla. I mean, they're awesome cars, though. Savannah, thank you. You got it. The holiday's not too far away if you're looking for ideas for a getaway with your family. Hopping on a cruise might be the way to go, but those trips, they're now a hot ticket. Post-pandemic travel demand rising, that means prices are rising. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us from Miami with more on that. Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. That rising tide line was nice, by the way, whoever wrote that. And yes, there is no question right now, Joe and Savannah, people feel a lot more comfortable now getting back onto cruise ships, especially when those cruise ships are going to the Caribbean. They also see it as a more economical option for thrill seekers. But the reality right now, higher demand equals higher prices, with one group finding it's been about a 40 percent increase for the major cruise lines if you look at December 2019 to this December. At the Port of Miami, business is booming. Vacationers are ready to set sail, with demand for cruises surging. The industry no longer facing headwinds from COVID. Do you think now, given where the state of affairs are, it's easier? Yeah, where things are right now, I feel like we're, we're pretty safe. We, we didn't fly in, we drove in. Laura Terry and Shandy Johnson came all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas, for a cruise to the Caribbean, which happens to feature new kids on the block, including singer Donnie Wahlberg. You're going to the Bahamas, right? Yes. But the first order of priority is seeing Donnie Wahlberg. Yes, yes. definitely. But right now, it's the cruise line singing to the tune of soaring sales. And higher demand has lifted prices substantially. According to data from Cruise Critic, the average price of a five-night cruise in the Caribbean, Bahamas, or Bermuda will now cost you $736 a person in December. That's 37% higher than a year ago and 43% more expensive than December of 2019. People had a lot more money to spend, and they're really looking for a vacation that's going to give them what they perceive as a lot more value, maybe, than a traditional land-based day. While some have sent warnings on social media. Just know it's going to be the most expensive vacation of your life. Many we spoke with said the climb in costs was expected. The prices are getting more expensive. Have you noticed that? Yes. And like, in my opinion, it's worth it because it's always a good time. Carnival telling us in a statement that even with rising prices, they deliver value of 25 to 50 percent over comparable land-based vacation alternatives. Norwegian similarly telling NBC News in part, cruising remains the best value for your vacation dollar. They're there to have that vacation of a lifetime. And so it's a really a win-win situation for everybody involved. In Miami, it's full steam ahead. What did you pay for your trip? <laughs> a lot. As passengers put less emphasis on pricing in order to set sail to paradise. And don't expect, guys, this cruise craze to stop anytime soon here at Port Miami. They are projecting an all-time record for passengers this year and way more than before the pandemic in 2019. Joe and Savannah. Sam, I really want to ask you about the new kids on the block cruise, but instead I'm just going to ask you, <laughs> if, you if you have any tips on how folks maybe can save a few bucks on their next cruise? <sighs> Yes, we're going to go back to that 80s, 90s reference in a second. But in terms of savings right now, Joe, a couple of things right now. There's websites you can go to like raise.com, hardcash.com, where they have discount cards. Bundles is another example. You can get great deals there on food. And, of course, unlimited drinks, very important. And then flexibility. If you're not set on a particular date or location, you can save money that way as well. But, guys, how about the new kids on the block bundle? 
Sign me up for that. Back to you. <laughs> I think I read an article about it recently, too, or something. But yeah, anyway. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It would take a lot to get me. I don't do well on boats. <laughs> How about the new kids on the block? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's doing it. Unlimited drinks would help. But. All right, coming up, we are honoring the heroes among us. After the break, one veteran who fell on tough times after serving, now he's using the art of songwriting to help others like him find their voice back home. That story up next. President Biden sat down with 60 Minutes and was asked about the American hostages taken by Hamas in Israel and his efforts to make a personal connection with the families involved. Here's a preview. Take a listen. Why do you feel so strongly about speaking to these families personally on Zoom? Because I think they have to know that the president of the United States of America cares deeply about what's happened to them, deeply. We have to communicate to the world this is critical. This is not even human behavior. It's, it's pure barbarism. And we're going to do everything in our power to get them home if we can find them. More of that interview will air Sunday on 60 Minutes. Well, we end the hour with a story about a special veteran. Ricky Andrews served in the U.S. Army for nearly a decade. But since leaving active duty, he faced some serious challenges. Now he is sharing his story in hopes that it will help others. Today, anchor Chanel Jones honored his service and work with a big surprise. At 40 years old, Ricky Andrews has lived a lifetime. Growing up in Longview, Texas, he had big dreams of playing pro baseball. But in college, the first baseman injured his shoulder and life took him down a different path. In 2007, he joined the U.S. Air Force, deploying to Afghanistan and Kurdistan. You've probably seen things that the rest of us can't even imagine. What was, I'd say, maybe the most rewarding part of it and what was the most challenging or the scariest? We did a lot of uh, humanitarian type stuff, um, so that was probably one of the best rewarding uh, aspects of it. But what were some of the harder times? I was a military cop, so um, if you can kind of take that mindset of what um, police officers and first responders deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, multiply that by, you know, 10 times. Those memories would stay with Ricky. He left active duty after serving eight years. As he was ending his final deployment and returning home, he faced what he couldn't have imagined. One of the hardest times was my last deployment coming back home. My dad passed away. Ricky never got to say goodbye. The last memory that I have was the memory before I even left. Ricky mourned his father, even as he turned to civilian life. He says he had a hard time adjusting. He moved to Nashville, eventually taking a job as an outreach coordinator with a nonprofit called Creative Vets, an organization that works to heal veterans with service-related trauma through art, including creative writing, visual arts, and songwriting. What we do for the songwriting, for the music program that we have, so we'll actually fly the veterans out to Nashville. They get to go backstage at the Grand Ole Opry. Wow. Um, they get to write with two hit songwriters and a veteran mentor that's already been through the program, so they're not alone. Four months later, Ricky faced his own darkest day. I actually had a suicide attempt. I had everything planned out. I had the letter written, had the pills lined up, I had everything ready to go. I have some friends of mine that play down, down on Broadway every weekend. So I went to go hear them. That night, they, they opened up with the national anthem. So it was something that reached out and grabbed me. And then I have a five-year-old goddaughter of mine that is basically like my biological daughter. And the week after this would have been her fifth birthday. After that, I was like, this doesn't need to happen. Just weeks later, he signed up to take a songwriting program at Creative Vets. That four hours was better than any other therapy session that I've been through in the eight years that I've been out of the military. Super, super therapeutic. And his goddaughter, Poppy, who calls him dad, helped open his eyes in a new way. I was supposed to take her to the park one day, um, and I was just not feeling like it. And she looked at me and she said, Dad, a promise is a promise. And I was like, man, um, that really hit. Because um, when I, on my last deployment, when I was, uh, before I left, my dad always told me, say, hey, you come back. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, a promise is a promise. Their conversation inspired Ricky's song. Dad, I'm worth it. Yeah, life has torn you down, but I need you to stick around. We got so much to do. Dad, I heard it when you told me that you love me, and love don't choose to leave, then leave somebody you miss. Dad, I promise is a promise. Oh so my goodness. there's a little clip it that I had her mom send me. A promise is a promise. So every morning I always listen to it. 
it gets me through the day. Just a few months ago, Ricky's car was stolen. He serves as a caretaker for his mother and has been using her car to get to work with the veterans. But on this morning, we had a little surprise for oh, him. Okay. Hang on a second. I'm gonna tell you something. A lot of people care about you. A lot of people care about you. Poppy wants to give you the keys to this car. Wait, what? Yeah. Progress program. Uh, they support veterans like yourself, and I can't think of a more deserving person to get this new car. Oh my God! All thank the best. You. Did you say thank you? That was the best. You want to take a look at your new car, my yeah. friend? Yeah. Let's go look. It's amazing. Oh my gosh! Look. How do you feel? Shocked. Like 110 yeah. percent. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to this one right here. She gets me through every day. So much for it. His daughter. Our thanks to Chanel Jones for that. A great surprise for, of course, a deserving veteran. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. It's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.